All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, we are going to round out a discussion that we've been having about the four Brahma Viharas. And tonight, we're going to talk about what most people refer to as metta. We're going to talk about the language of all of this, but the Sanskrit word is maitra. So know those two words. And also know that what's going to be in the kind of a format of these four. But we've already done a, a talk, a Dharma Doors, about Upeksha, about Mudita, and about Karunya. That was last week. So I felt inclined to round everything out with a talk about loving, what is called loving kindness. So, I may need this anymore. Cool. Okay. So, we've also already talked about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Brahma Viharas, the abodes of Brahma. Um, so, we talked about a lot of this, but because interestingly, within that framework that I just showed you, Metta is number one. <laughs> I, sh I, I should have started with that one. <laughs> And so I, I guess we could look at it as if the classes about Upeksha, Mudita, and Karunya were exciting, how do we access compassion? How do we access joy or empathic joy? How do we access this Upeksha? Through metta, through this idea of kindness. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight is being kind. We're going to talk as usual. We're going to talk about what this word sort of means linguistically. We're going to talk about what it means in practice. We're going to talk about what this word means in, in all kinds of different ways. So at, as usual, let's start with just the language. At this point, at, and maybe it's because I, I am a, of a teacher of Buddhism and move in Buddhist circles, but it seems like metta has almost become an English word the way dharma is now, you know, an acceptable word. Metta is getting very close as far as, you know, I see people using it in greetings, in salutations. Um, and so it's almost become a word unto itself, just uh, metta. But when it is used within the Buddhist world, it's usually translated as loving kindness. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to loving kindness. I'm not opposed to even translating that word or that idea of metta as loving kindness. There's a way in which it, it leans, or at least in use, it leans a little bit more towards the, the kindness side of that than the loving side of things. But only because this, of course, is not in any way amorous, it's not amorous uh, love, it's closer to that kind of agape of the Christian tradition, a kind of brotherly love or um, sibling love in that way. So loving kindness is cool, but there's a way in which it's nice to know that the word has actually the connotation of friendliness, of being friendly. And that's sort of when it, where I wanna to start tonight we are, by the way, going to jump back into the sutra that we've been reading. And the group here, at least everybody I can see, is very familiar with the sutra we've been working on. So that's cool. So we are going to dive back into that. But you, as usual, let's sort of talk about an idea for a little while and talk about this idea of metta. So one thing that I wanted to start off with, just to give you a kind of interesting, just something in the back of your mind. Many of you may know that within the Buddhist tradition, there is this uh, a, a prophecy, right? But this idea that there will be an another Buddha, like there was the Buddha about 2,500 years ago in India. But the idea is that there's a, there'll be another one. Now, a lot of people are, you know, there's a lot of debate about when this future Buddha is going to arrive, everybody's pretty clear that it's not going to be for quite a while. 
but the name of that future Buddha who is to arrive at some future point is named Maitreya, Maitreya. And meaning the word, the name Maitreya, Maitreya means like the friendly one, the, the one who is just full uh, metta. And I forget how to say Maitreya in Pali, but there is basically a form of the word metta that is the name for Maitreya in Pali. And his, so his name is friendly, friendliness, the friendly one. And there's a lot of um, commentary on what exactly that means. <clears throat> Keep in mind, this is a old prof prophecy. This is not some Mahayana, Mahayana Buddhist mumbo jumbo or whatever. It's a very old kind of part of the tradition that the future Buddha will be called Maitreya. And the usual way that's interpreted is that the past Buddha, Shakyamuni, 2,500 years ago, taught the Dharma basically via discipline. Like more, what we would call moral discipline, but the precepts, the rules, a kind of living a clean, clear life, da 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 da. And the idea is, is that the future Buddha is going to be in a different, a different world, not the world of Shakyamuni. And so the teaching of the Dharma of the next Buddha, well, the idea, again, this is just an interpretation, but the idea is, is that that future Buddha is going to lead with loving kindness or friendliness. And by extrapolation, the other four Brahma Viharas or the other four immeasurables as they're called. And I do want to get around to that terminology in the immeasurables, but let's stick with just talking about the future Buddha, Maitreya. So the idea is, is that there's already this sense, even in the early Buddhist tradition, that things will be different <laughs> in the future and the Dharma will be potentially taught in a different way. And so that leads us to this framework of these four, well, they're usually referred to as, in, in, in any tradition you look at, they're refer, referred to as these four states of mind. We've talked about them, as I've noted, we've spoken about them as the four Brahma Viharas, the abodes of Brahma the god Brahma, these heavenly abodes. But there's another term for these four, which is apramanya, immeasurable. And so these four apramanyas, these four immeasurables, they're the same four. And I used to, th I used to think that it was basically that the, the Hinayana, the early tradition referred to them as the Brahma Viharas, and the Mahayana referred to them as these immeasurables. And that, it, that kind of squares with usage, but you do see just a lot of crossover. So I just want you to know that the, these, both of those terms, Bra, uh, Brahma Viharas and Apramanya, they're used pretty interchangeably, but they do have a different connotation. So let's back up let me back up let's start talking about <clears throat> the four of these in practice i want to do something interesting and i've used this example before to talk about these <clears throat> but the one thing that i want to mention because you 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 might all already be familiar and i've even talked about it with the practice of extending metta, extending loving kindness, extending compassion, extending mudita or joy, and extending upeksha. And this idea of sort of as a meditative um, asati, meaning a, a, a mindfulness practice, one sort of meditates, that, that word's always so tricky, but one meditates 
on loving kindness, focuses on loving kindness, feels loving kindness, and then extends this loving kindness. And it's a practice. It's a deep, deep practice. I encourage it in that way. But I want to apply this to more than just meditation. I always want Dharma doors to be a little more applicable to, to like daily, daily life. And so an example that I've used in the past is if you happen to live in like an apartment complex, you could think of this as your neighborhood too, if you live in a neighborhood or what have you, but it kind of works really well with the idea of living in an apartment complex. And the idea is, is that, you know, if you're a kind of a regular sort of person that way, you probably come in, in and out of your apartment complex for every day for one reason or another, coming in, coming out. And as you come in and as you come out, you encounter in one way or another, your neighbors, your apartment neighbors. And the idea is, is that we sort of can meet our neighbors, meet our, our, apartment, our apartment complex neighbors. We can meet them. Well, we could meet them with, in a variety of different ways. But two main ways that I'm thinking of is that we could meet everybody with a kind of what I call the stink face, this kind of like, just sort of mm, like bitter, angry, but, and you could imagine the idea of sort of walking in your apartment complex and, you know, this neighbor, their music's too loud. And this neighbor, the, you know, the, the, the smell of their, their apartment in a, in a food way. So not a, stenchy way but it's a food i don't like to eat and it's wafting into the hallway and that yeah you know those so there's those people and the loud people and this and that oh here goes this guy again and and you could have this really kind of not so friendly mindset and we would wear it we would wear that mindset on our on our face in that way and so the idea is, is that if you're meeting everybody with that, that, that's sort of the reverberations that you're putting out there. And then of course, people are sort of responding to in that way. And then lo and behold, we find ourselves living in, our, in the world of our apartment complex where there's that guy's loud music and that guy's stinky apartment and this guy, da, 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 da. The practice could be though, and it would be a practice if you started in that mindset, the practice would be to meet everyone in your apartment with friendliness. And you don't have to be some ear to ear grinning, like, hi, how are you today? But talking about like actually in your heart center, being friendly and the idea here is, is that that friendliness, the metta, so tonight's topic, that entryway of rather than meeting it with not being friendly, meeting everybody and everyone by being friendly, it, it cracks open this doorway in that sense. And what I mean is, is that now that we're encountering and meeting everybody with friendliness, now, all of a sudden, I'm open to compassion. I'm open to a deeper level of karunya, where it's actually not just about a sort of friendliness that I'm extending to everyone. It's not just about that. It's an even deeper place in the heart where now it's about compassion for, for all these, everyone, everybody in the apartment complex. Like, you know, really, truly, like, you know, how are you doing? Like, you know, just sort of really concerned about everybody's well-being, just really, really hoping everybody is doing well. And so going in and out of your apartment with that mindset. And then, of course, the idea is, is that now that we're operating from that space of compassion, we are now totally open to the possibility of being joyful for everyone, not 
we have now come very far from being not friendly to them. We are now actually, we listen to the music and we hear now the neighbor that had the loud music, but we hear that they're laughing. We hear that they're having a good time and that doesn't annoy us. It's we're joyful, empathically joyful. Oh, they're having a good time. Huh, I was really kind of judging them harshly in that way. And then you walk by that neighbor's apartment that had the smell and you hear the maybe the sound of their family gathered around this table eating this food. And you're, are, you are moved with joy to smell this this family having a meal type of a thing. And so all of a sudden now you're coming in and out of that apartment complex in a whole other frame of mind. From a Buddhist point of view though, all of this is actually to lead us to that state of upeksha, the state of equanimity. And that state of equanimity, the way that I wanna describe it tonight to bring this all full circle, that state of equanimity is now being able to go in and out of that apartment complex and these sounds, these smells, these sights, it's not ah, like bothering us and like getting us all worked up in anger. We actually can now walk through the hallway in peace. And the, and the point is, is that it's not that the neighbors turned the music down and now I can walk through the hallways in peace. It's not that those people moved and the new people don't make stinky food. It's actually my mind is now changed and I'm walking down the hallway in peaceful equanimity. And it's not that the joy is gone. It's not that the compassion is gone. It's not that the friendliness is gone, but it's that, that that's really even keeled state of mind that is not affected by this sensory cacophony. That's this kind of upeksha. And what I just described the place of practice is the entryway to your apartment complex. Every day, every time you come in and out, how are you, what's the mindset that you're in, in terms of that practice? So, everybody feeling okay about metta as a general practice there? Simple, but important. Awesome. Awesome. So, Awesome. Now, now that we have a good sense about that. So using, I'll stick, I hadn't planned on it, but I might as well. Let me stick with our apartment complex. <laughs> so you can look at what I just described. E even the, the idea of uh, practicing off the mat or practicing off the cushion, right? You can look at that idea I described as just coming in and out of your apartment, in and out of your neighborhood, and being in as a form of practice and noticing if you're mean, if you're being mean or if you're angered and all of that. So that practice, you could actually look at it two different ways. One way to look at it is about my peace of mind, my emotional state. And it's about this idea that I'm now able to move in and out of my apartment complex without being worked up in that way. And not only that, I have this really, you know, much more open, open heart center where I'm really meeting everybody honestly with friendliness and compassion and joy and all of that. And so it feels better than, you know, being mean in that way. There's a way of looking at all of that. And it's all about my state of mind, my practice. There's another way of looking at that example though, where it's about the apartment complex. Like every, all, the peop, all the other people in the apartment complex, which includes you, you live in the apartment complex too. But the idea is, is that there's a way of approaching that same exact practice, but where the intention you could say the, the desire, you could say the wish, the vow, but where the intention is, is not about my mind, 
my emotional balance, my this and that, but it's actually a, a, a real compassionate concern for the apartment complex in a much deeper way. And it would be at that point that we would begin to describe, well, last week I called it the Maha Karunya, the, the great compassion. Tonight, we're talking about the Maha Metta or the Maha Maitreya, the, that Maha friendliness. Well, what makes it Maha? What makes it great friendliness or great compassion? It has to do with that intention. And is the intention about like, you know, I, I, ha I haven't had a good night's sleep in a week because of this guy's music and this guy's food. So I'm going to do this practice so that I can get a good night's sleep. That, and there's nothing wrong with a good night's sleep, trust me. And bodhisattvas sleep very well. That's, you know, let's not forget that. But the idea is, is that that soul desire to just work on yourself, that's what's called the little vehicle. That's what's called the Hinayana. And it's not even about the practice. It's the exact same practice. What is different is the intention. Am I doing this to better myself? Or am I doing this sort to actually sort of radically change both my mind and my world that I live in in that way? And so that's where I have used the apartment complex in the past to talk about this idea of these pure lands and purifying a Buddha land. The way that I understand it, purifying a Buddha land is living in this nightmare apartment complex where everybody's music is too loud and everybody's food is too stinky <laughs> to, to moving to this beautiful apartment complex where there's this joyful spirit in the air and people have music and people are eating and it's this pure land. Same, same exact apartment complex, different mind, but the point is the Bodhisattva knows that their loving kindness and their compassion is affecting the minds of everybody in the apartment complex and realizes, oh, every time I was coming into this apartment complex, with my anger, I was like infecting, infecting every, remember the Buddhists call anger a poison. It's like, oh, I'm infecting people with my, you know, disposition and my bitterness, because when I meet them with that, it kind of like, oh, you know, and then we, we know about kind of transference in a psychological sense. And so there's a way in which everybody in that apartment complex is living with a stink face. But then if they're living with a, uh, a, you know, a joyful bodhisattva in that way, that's going to become effect, affectatious in that sense. And that would be described as purifying a Buddha land. All right. So check this out. We're talking tonight, not so much about the four Brahma Viharas, but these four immeasurables. Well, what does it mean in an immeasurable state of mind? What does that mean? Imme why, do this, why does the Buddha always talk about immeasurable and incountable, inconceivable? What, like what, what's up with that? And the idea is, is in a place that I always start, when, whenever in, within the world of Buddhism, whenever I'm like, well, what does that mean? The first thing I do is I think, well, what would be a measurable mind? <laughs> Great question, because right? if I knew what a measurable mind was, an immeasurable mind might make more sense. And my feeling about it, and so this is sort of an interpretation in that way, but in that mode where one is only concerned about one's well-being, one's own, only one's own well-being in that way, and is doing the practice, whether it's the loving kindness practice or whether it's just Zen or Zazen or 
um, sati, mindfulness, whatever it is, if you're doing it just for yourself, the results of that are measurable. How'd you sleep last night? How was your morning bowel movement? How are these things? It's quite measurable. How, would you, how could you measure benefiting the lives of many sentient beings in an apartment complex? How could you possibly begin to measure the, the effects of that? They are, they are immeasurable. They are infinite in number in that way. If you really begin to think of these sort of rip, rippling effects of a mind that is set on everyone's well-being, a mind that's set just on their own well-being, that's quite, quite measurable in that, in that sense. So that, that kind of makes sense in that Mahayana way where it's like, oh, wow, that is a very, that's a different vow in that way, so. All right, excellent. So speaking of which, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a few more things, but they come from the reading. So let's dive into the reading. So as everybody knows, there's multiple versions of this sutra that we've been working on, one from Tibetan, one from Chinese, we have English, kind of translations of both. Tonight, I'm going to read from the yellow book, the, the, from the Chinese translation. I have my, my own translation I'm working on, but it's, this part's a little rough. Um, I found that ultimately, the, this version, the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras version, I ultimately found I really like just for this vow, for this vow in particular. Oh, speaking of which, we are about to do another one of Manjushri, Bodhisattva Manjushri's vows. Um, we've been working on this section for a while, and we've been going through these 10 vows of the Bodhisattva Manjushri. And as I've mentioned, when you read these Mahayana sutras, you often hear about different Bodhisattvas making these vows concerning what their pure land will be like, what their apartment complex will be like in the future when they have really, really done this practice. What will their pure land be like? And each bodhisattva, their vows are always a little different. And it always sort of is, a, you know, if you become really interested in these things, it, it gets really interesting, the differences between the types of vows and like what they express. What I mean to say is that Manjushri, being the bodhisattva of wisdom, the bodhisattva of pranya, of emptiness, he, you know, his Buddha land has been a wild Buddha land. There's been a lot of sort of interesting twists and turns. And so as we've moved our way up, we, I want to just remind you, last week, we did three vows. And the one thing that, like an overarching theme of those three vows, was that in Manjushri's apartment complex <laughs> of, of a pure land, everyone, when they just think of food, boop, they're going to have it. When they think of clothing, boop, they're going to have it. And when they think of just kind of anything, they will have it. Except in Manjushri's Buddha land, all the bodhisattvas, because his Buddha land is populated entirely by bodhisattvas, the bodhisattvas will first have the thought of offering the food or the clothing or whatever it is, offering it to all the Buddhas of the 10 directions and all sentient beings that are in need and all the hungry ghosts and all those suffering in the hell realms. And then they partake of the food or the clothing or whatever it is. And that's just the way Bodhisattva Manjushri sort of dreams or wishes that that's how it'll go down in Manjushri's apartment complex of a Buddha land. <laughs> So on the kind of on the heels of that, 
we come to, oh, also, by the way, because it's going to come up, I want to remind you that last week we learned about what Manjushri will be called in the future when Manjushri becomes a Buddha. Uh, Samantha Darshan is, is going to be Manjushri's Buddha name. And we learn the name of his, what the, the Buddha land is going to be called. And that's going to come up in, in this one. So. so this is going to be, <clears throat> oh, I will tell you, though, for everybody who ha who's on, who happens to be on 84,000.read, uh, uh, the Tibetan version, I'm at line 1.258. So if you're on that, that version, Otherwise, I'm in the Chong book here, page, uh, page 181. So Manjushri continued speaking to the Buddha, saying thus, Furthermore, I have vowed that in my Buddha land, or I should say, apologies, I have vowed that my Buddha land will be formed or made out of incalculable amounts of wonderful jewels, and it will be adorned with immeasurable, interlaced, exquisite, wish-fulfilling jewels, mani jewels. These mani, wish-fulfilling mani jewels will be exceptionally rare and difficult to find throughout the 10 directions. The names of these money jewels will be so numerous that no one could finish recounting them all, even in a million years. My land, my Buddha land, will, be, will appear to be made of gold to those bodhisattvas who wish for it to be, to appear to be made of gold, and will appear to be made of silver to the bodhisattvas for, who wish for it to be made of silver without affecting its golden appearance to those who wish for it to be made of gold. According to the Bodhisattva's wishes in, in my Buddha land, it will appear to be, the world will be made, appear to be made of crystal, lapis lazuli, agate, pearls, or any of the other seven treasures without affecting its appearance to the other Bodhisattvas. It will also appear to be made of fragrant sandalwood, or a fragrant aloes wood, or of red sandalwood, or of many other kinds of woods, all according to the Bodhisattva's wishes. Okay, I'll pause there. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on there. there there's more, by the way. So, So the first thing that I'd like to draw your attention to in the reading is the repeated use of ideas such as incalculable amounts of wonderful jewels, innumerable or immeasurable numbers of money jewels, and so on. So this language, again, of immeasurable numbers, immeasurable numbers of pearls, Given what I just said regarding the, or a measurable mind versus an immeasurable mind. And I want you to kind of recall or, or think about it, that this idea of like quantifiable, measurable, you know, like put it up to a machine and measure this or, you know, measurable. And then what I was saying regarding like what happens when the intention is for everyone and it's rippling out infinitely? Like that's this bodhisattva, bodhisattva vision of immeasurability in that sense. And all of a sudden, this you know, very kind of hinayana, the little vehicle where it's all very like, you know, measurable in that way. Well, if you're into that, if you're into noticing a kind of measurability and immeasurability to the bodhisattva path, then carry that over when you hear about bodhisattva Manjushri's pure land, it's going to have immeasurable, it's going to be made out of innumerable or uncountable numbers of these 
exquisite jewels and then adorned with these wish fulfilling jewels, the money jewel. So really interesting. I wanna tell you this. this, is one of those beautiful Dharma coincidences that happens. So I'm, I, I already know that loving kindness like metta or, or yeah, metta, I, I already know it's, it doesn't come up in the reading tonight. <laughs> So I already knew that I was going to have to sort of um, pull some Dharma magic in making my, because I, I wanted to talk about um, loving kindness from last week. And so I, you know, I won't, and who doesn't want to talk about friendliness? So I wanted to do that, but I was like, hmm, how am I going to, you know, weave this over into this wild pure land with these immeasurable jewels and all of that. And interestingly, I was looking up the usage of the word um, maitra, the, the Sanskrit word for friendliness. And so, you know, you find these databases of usage. And so it's, you know, oh, it's used in this sutra this way, used in this sutra this way. And in this description that I was reading of the different uses of, of loving kindness or friendliness, it used the analogy, it pulled from a sutra and it said that a bodhisattva with this sort of uh, uh, friendliness, kindness, loving kindness attitude, and in, in, it, was a, it was an entry on the four immeasurables, so all four states of mind, a bodhisattva cultivating those was likened to the mani jewel, the wish-fulfilling mani jewel, but a very particular aspect of this thing. So if you don't know, there's this elusive object in the world of Buddhism called the Mani Jewel. M-A-N with the, the tongue in the back of the mouth. So, mm, so it's a Mani Jewel. And this wish, this money jewel, you hear about it a lot. Oh, and by the way, if you ever iconographically, if you ever see a Buddha or maybe a Buddha, um, like a Buddhist monk, a statue, statue of a Buddha, statue of a Buddhist monk, and they're holding a sphere that might be on, appear to be on fire, like a flaming jewel or a flaming sphere, I should say. That is symbolically this money, money jewel. In particular, if you see it in the lap of a Buddha, so the Buddha has a ball or a sphere in the lap, and especially if that sphere it has a little like uh, flame above it, so it's kind of looking on fire, that's the wish fulfilling jewel, as it's called, the money jewel. And I started to get interesting and interested in these money jewels because they pop up all the time. And the, my first foray into researching this topic revealed that a, a money could be many things. It could be a pearl it, from like a oyster pearl. It could be a stone. It could be a jewel, like a, a ruby, emerald, like a, a, some sort of jewel or a crystal. So it could be a lot of different, uh, of, of a, a lot of different materials, but it had the property of fulfilling wishes. So it was kind of a good luck charm, if you want, in that way. But the idea was, is that you could do different kinds of uh, magic, if you will, but you could do different processes. And there's some schools of thought that these stones or these things just occur naturally. They, you don't have to do any magic. They just are already magical. Different schools of thought. But the idea is, is that at the end, whatever it is, is now a money, a, a money pearl or a money jewel or a money stone and it can fulfill wishes, it can grant wishes. So there's another, so that was my first foray and that's mainly what a money jewel is, is a uh, wish fulfilling object of some sort. There's other things going on with money jewels, 
But one other thing that came up though in my research was, and these were particularly money um, stones. So specifically uh, some sort of rock or stone or something like that. And what they talk about is a money stone that is able to be put into murky polluted water and it purifies it. So some sort of Brita, some sort of Brita filter from the past or something maybe. But so there was a particular kind of money stone that was a kind of water purifier in that way. And it was known about, like it was known that there were these types of monies. And so in this sutra, it says a bodhisattva cultivating the four immeasurable mind states is like one of those money jewels when placed in water, it purifies the water. That's like our bodhisattva going into that apartment complex and sort of now helping to purify that whole situation in that way. So they liken that bodhisattva mind state to being like a wish fulfilling jewel. And there's other connotations too, as far as that. I wanna bring it back to the sutra because what happens is, and you'll love this, a money, a money jewel, you know, there are, there are stories about Buddhist stories about kings going way out deep into the ocean to find these very large pearls that were going to be money, money pearls. They would bring them back and they would, you know, get them polished and then er erect them on these, uh, uh, like a, a pedestal in that way. And then the idea was, is that whatever the king wished for was granted to like their kingdom. And so they went to great lengths to find these money jewels. Well, the thing that happens in Manjushri's Buddha land here is that the ground is littered with wish fulfilling money jewels. <laughs> and the idea there is about and my feeling about it. There's a lot of different ways to interpret that. This idea of there being all these, these wish fulfilling jewels sort of everywhere. It kind of pertains to the teaching last week about the food, clothing, and necessities. This speaks to sort of about, you know, scarcity and the ideas of living in, in, impoverished in that sense. And so part of, of course, the Bodhisattva's desire for their apartment complex is that nobody in the apartment complex should want or need. And so the idea is, is that that's the mindset of a Bodhisattva coming in and out of the apartment complex is, I really hope everybody has enough. I really hope everybody has all the food they need. I really hope everybody has the clothing they need. I really hope everybody has enough. A, a way of saying that, a beautiful way of saying that is in my Buddha land, the ground is going to be strewn with money jewels so that the possibility of anybody needing anything just won't even be possible in that sense. And I want to reiterate, and I, I know I've said this many times in the pri prior classes, but this is about cultivating a mindset in that way. And I know that it's like, it's, you hear this about the money jewels everywhere and all of that. And it's like, oh, isn't this a bit much? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it might, this all might be a bit much. And I've said that before too, that this is a particular flavor of Buddhism, this style. But what they are trying to cultivate in a way is, a, a, is a, that mentality. And I mentioned this last week, but what I said last week is that once you make that bodhisattva vow that I've talked about ever since the beginning of this series, once you make that vow where it's like, oh, I'm, this, my practice, like all of, all of this, all of this I'm doing, this is, this is sort of for everybody. That's not just for me. As soon as you make that vow and have that mentality, you start to become much more aware of the things that you're doing that are not compassionate, not friendly, 
because you're much more deeply sort of, you know, interested in not being that way. <laughs> and so now you, you are now um, prompted, I would say, or, but the Bodhisattva now is sort of always in Vipassana, always in that insightful mode of noticing not being friendly and being curious what's with that why like why wouldn't i be friendly to this person what do i have to lose to be friendly like what's what's up with that and so i guess a main theme tonight is how the bodhisattva's practice is sort of everywhere always in that sense and not just these particular seated meditation moments in that way all right any questions so far, comments or ideas about stuff that's come up? Yeah, Tanya. I'm sorry, you might have already mentioned this, and I, I might have missed it, but Mani jewels, are they around in the, in the Hinayana? Hmm. Or is this like a Mahayana thing? There, you, you'll find them in the Hinayana, but they're, um, I'll tell you the one major reference. Um, it, this is a beautiful one, uh, and actually, thanks, Tanya, because I wanted to mention this one. It's it's a fun, it's a funny. It's I, I won't go too deep on this, but you may know that the Buddha, meaning the historical Buddha, you may know that that Buddha was called as a birth name in that sense. Siddhartha. And Siddhartha, that word, means wish fulfilled. And supposedly it was because Sudhana, the king, the Buddha's father, so wanted a son, and not a daughter in that way, wanted someone to keep going, that it was his like wish to have a son. And so when he did have a son, he named him Siddhartha, my wish fulfilled. In the Hinayana, you begin to see this thing happen where the Buddha, as a kind of reference to that name Siddhartha, the Buddha Shakyamuni in that way, is referred to as the real Mani jewel, the real fulfiller of wishes. And he's described that way as this sort of, well, I mean, it's, it's a general reference to the Buddha as teacher and as the alleviator of suffering. And this idea that all beings kind of deep, deepest wish is to be liberated. That's the idea. All beings deepest wish is to be liberated. And the Buddha is the fulfiller of that desire, of that wish, I should say. And so they say that, yeah, you can go out, and this is where you find these references where it's like, yeah, you can go out to wherever and find a money jewel that emits light, but encountering the Buddha is the real money jewel, is the real wish fulfilled in that way. And it's these off references like that about either the, them emitting light or doing these other things that, um, well, we still don't quite know what a money jewel is. So, but yeah. And then I think, are they like, if you look at the Tibetan or like Vajrayana, like, aren't they those little balls at the mm. bottom? Like they're like mm. little stacks of like film, like cannonball looks almost like. I have heard definitely that the three balls are money jewels, but I've also heard that they are the triple, triple gem, like the Buddha Dharma Sangha as like a, yeah, so you get different interpretations of that symbol. But, yep. All right. So let's keep going. And if so, if all of that sounds good in terms of the um, sort of the un unbelievability of all of this, um, let's talk for a moment. Um, yeah, let's definitely talk for a moment. In Manjushri's Buddha land, he mentions this interesting thing that for bodhisattvas who want it to appear gold, it appears gold. But for those who want it to appear silver, 
it appear silver, or if they want it to appear made out of woods or gold, whatever, it all appears that way to them without affecting the way that it appears to all the other bodhisattvas who are seeing it in some other medium. That's a very interesting line, especially for somebody like myself who teaches this kind of dharma and teaches this pure land stuff as about intersubjectivity. I often talk about this idea of the objective world versus the subjective world and the idea of kind of an infinite number of subjective experiences without there being this even a concept of the objective, the one objective world or objective truth in that sense. So I've done a lot of talking about that already as a way to think of Pure Land stuff. So I find that a very interesting line where in, in Mandra Shri's land, there truly is no objective reality. It just appears the way the Bodhisattva would like it to appear in that sense. <clears throat> Okay, but it continues. He says, and then now it gets very interesting. My Buddha land will not be illuminated by the brilliance of the sun, the moon, stars, fire, or lamps. All the bodhisattvas in my Buddha land will emit hundreds of billions of myriads of light beams from their own bodies illuminating their Buddha lands. In my land, it will be daytime. And you, it, what it means, and this is from the Chinese, we know it says in my land, because it's not about the sun or the moon, in my land, it will be daytime because all the flowers will open and nighttime because all the flowers will close and the seasons will change according to the bodhisattva's wishes. There will be no cold, no heat, no old age, no illness, no death. So let's talk about that because it's always fun to talk about light. <laughs> so you find this one a lot. Um, yeah, we got plenty of time. So you, you find this one a lot, the idea of bodhisattvas emitting light beams from their bodies. You hear it about Buddhas emitting light from either certain locations on their body, which is always symbolic of something, or just every single hair pore emitting light. In Manjushri's Buddha land, Things will not be illuminated by the sun, the moon, the stars, fire, or lamps, but the bodhisattvas are illuminating everything of their own bodies. So that's a very interesting idea. And I wanted to share, uh, this kind of came up. Um, anyways, what comes up regarding this is this seems to be related to what is sometimes referred to as the light body, L, you know, light, L-I-G-H-T, so not lightweight, but light body. The luminous body, sometimes in, in the more Vajrayana circles. So, uh, it, yeah, because there's time, I'd I want to tell you about this, wasn't planned. So what's up with this, this uh, light body, right? I don't, I don't know, but I'll offer... Uh, possibilities and suggestions, as I always do. So a way, to, a way to think about this, just a way to think about it. So I often talk about, I guess what you would call identity, identification, and wrapped up with those ideas is appropriation. And so what I talk about when I talk about those ideas of identity, identification, and appropriation is it's about concepts of self. And so one of the things that we do, and we've talked about this many, many times on Dharma Doors, but one of the things that we do is we say something like, I have a hand. 
In fact, I have two hands. And that's a weird way to think. I have hands. So that to me sounds like you could lose your hands like in an accident. And then you would say, I don't have hands anymore. Huh? So these hands are not you. You have hands, right? This is what you're telling me when you tell me that about your hands. So there's an interesting relationship in terms of self, I, and then have hands. And I assume, as I always say, I assume that that goes for your feet too, and your legs, and your heart, and your this, and your that. And in fact, it goes for all of it. So you aren't any of that stuff is what you're, you're telling me, but you have, you have all of that stuff. You have hands, feet, hair, and you might lose your hair. You might lose all of these things, but then that would be you without those. Okay. Where is that you that has hands and has a body and has, where is, where is that exactly? A, a classic Buddhist conundrum that the teacher always asks the student, let's find, let's find this self of yours. And as I often say, you could keep looking for it and the, the West, Western science, Western psychology is still looking for the self. Whereas the Buddhists were like, oh, there just isn't that self. There's a mind tendency to like appropriate and be like, my pencil, my computer, my hand, <laughs> my words, my idea, mine, 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 mine. And it's the my-ing, the, the, the my mind that is generating this idea of a self that has hands and all of that. So if I've got you in the right frame of mind, where you're kind of feeling like maybe you are not your body in that sense, like, or recognizing that identifying with the body is kind of a choice in that way. It's kind of a state of mind to be identified and be like, this is me. So if you're following me on all of that, just a, a quick rundown about no self ideas, then we could talk about that state of mind that is not identified with the physical body, yet is not completely in the state of neither perception nor non-perception, is not a fully enlightened Buddha in a non-dual state of total emancipation, but a mind state that is not clinging to the physical body as a physical body in that sense, but was cognizant of something very interesting. And what that thing, that interesting thing is, is that all of you right now are not experiencing my body of flesh, my physical body. Every Sunday night, you actually encounter a light body, literally, a literally a body of light, photonic light jumping off the screen. And that there is the reality of that. And if you get really into that, you'll recognize that even people that are in your physical presence, when they're looking at you, they are encountering a photonic, a light, a light body. They're not encountering your gross physical body of tangible matter flesh they're bzz, 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 you, you you're seeing the light body and so you could in a way kind of sort of identify with that body the that kind of a reflective body and that would start to make this description of bodhisattva's 
emitting light of their own bodies, it kind of starts to make a little more sense if you start to think of it that way, as far as the reflective body of light and not the gross heavy body of gravity, <laughs> just to put it one way, but um, everybody okay with that? And, and that's a kind of way out there interpretation of the light body. It's just kind of fun. So yeah, Tanya. Yeah, I, I really dug the photon thing. Um, cool. Totally. <laughs> um, but, but, but and I don't know much about it, but is it, I mean, you know, also some sort of an energetic thing as well? There are a number of ways to, def to describe the light body. Absolutely. <clears throat> I was just trying to give us another, another way to, to possibly think about it. Yeah. And photons are energetic. So that's, you know, it's consistent with that, but that's what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that we know or have some ideas about these bodhisattvas emitting lights of their own bodies, <clears throat> it gets better because in Manjushri's Buddha land, if they wish, bodhisattvas in my land may go to any other land and attain supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. They will attain it after being reborn in the Tushita heaven, descending, and then when their life comes to an end, they will enter nirvana in that land. And he says this thing at the end, no one in my Buddha land will attain nirvana. <laughs> but he's already referenced this before, if you'll remember, and it has to do with the, the main or one of the one of the main aspects of the Bodhisattva vow, which is usually interpreted as yeah, it's usually kind of glossed, summarized as the bodhisattva not entering final nirvana until all sentient beings have entered enlightenment or nirvana already. And then sort of like as a, as a grand, you know, uh, flourish at the end, the bodhisattva enters nirvana. It's not quite like that. It's kind of more about, it goes, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, the Hinayana, the individual is like, get me out of here. <laughs> this is crazy. Good luck, everybody. I'm out of here. And enters Nirvana. The Bodhisattva says, you know what? I'm going to stick around and then let's all get out of here together, kind of an idea. So my point is, in, in fulfillment of that, Manjushri says, in, in my Buddha land, no Bodhisattva is going to kind of prematurely enter nirvana. Every bodhisattva in my Buddha land sticking around to fulfill that great vow of the bodhisattva. But what he says though, is this funny thing that, but if anybody wants to, they can just go be reborn in some other world, get reborn in the Tushita heaven, descend down to the world, become a Buddha and enter nirvana. <laughs> just like that. So, you know. And in Manjushri's Buddha land, Though they will not appear visibly to the eye, it says, there will, there will appear in the sky hundreds of thousands of musical instruments, or the sound, I should say, the sound of hundreds of thousands of musical instruments. Their music will not be the sounds of greed and desire, but will be the sounds of the paramitas, the excellences, the sounds of Buddha. Dharma, Sangha, and the sounds of the kind of the, the treasury of the Dharma of Bodhisattvas. The Bodhisattvas will be able to hear the wonderful Dharma sounds in proportion to their understanding. And if they wish to see the Buddha, they will see that Buddha uh, Samanta Darshan, sitting under the Bodhi tree, as soon as they think of seeing him, wherever they are, whether walking, sitting, or standing. Bodhisattvas who happen to have doubts about the Dharma 
will break the net of their doubts and comprehend the, the meaning of the Dharma at the very sight of that Buddha, uh, Samantha Darshan, without receiving any explanation. <laughs> okay. So it's going to be pretty easy to access knowledge and wisdom in Magistri's Buddha land. The moment we think of it, oh, there will be the Buddha Samanta Darshan. And if you remember, that was the name of Manjushri in the future, like when he becomes a Buddha. So this is where the, the sutra starts to do that kind of weird thing where it's like Manjushri is one idea and Samanta Darshan like this fully enlightened version of Manjushri is this other idea. And they are only like, what I'm getting at is, is that in terms of the literature, it's like, what are the, what are they separated by time? They, they don't seem to be separated by time in that way, because they kind of are talking about them simultaneously. But I'm just mean to tell you that the, the, the beauty of the literature is that it actually, like for anybody who's actually interested in literature, like the use of language to evoke things in the mind, this literature is really weird. The way it plays with talking about the past in the present or talking about the future in the present. So it's like, whoa, when, when slash where am I? Um, and I think that's all very intentional to sort of, you know, kind of get meditative in that sense. Any questions about all, anything that was about the music? Pretty classic thing about Pure Lands. There's just this like elevator music of the Dharma everywhere where it's just like, as you're walking, it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. All right, so speaking of, speaking of that conflation of future, present, past, after all of that, after the description of Manjushri's ninth vow, which is this vow about you know, the fulfillment of all wishes in that way, then at that time in the assembly, incalculable numbers, uh, uh, sorry, incalculable hundreds of thousands of billions of myriads of bodhisattvas all said in unison, he who or anyone who hears the name Samanta Darshan Bhutta will obtain excellent benefits, let alone those who are able to be born in that pure land of Samanta Darshan. If someone has the opportunity to hear the Dharma on the prediction of Manjushri's attainment of Buddhahood, if, if anybody happens to hear that explained and hears the name Manjushri mentioned, they will be meeting the Buddha face to face. <laughs> and, and again, this is the Dharma on the prediction of Manjushri's attainment of Buddhahood. So they're telling us anybody who hears this sutra will attain great benefit. And anybody who hears this name Manjushri or Samantha, so it's all referencing what you are currently experiencing. And that I always find very profound about Buddhist sutras, that kind of self-reflexive thing going on. The Buddha said to the Bodhisattvas, so it is, so it is, just as you say. Suppose a person keeps in mind hundreds of thousands of billions of, the, of Buddha's names. And then suppose another person keeps in mind the name of the Bodhisattva Manjushri. The blessings of the latter outnumber those of the former, let alone the blessings of those who keep in mind the name Samanta Darshan Buddha. Why? Because even the benefits with even the benefits which hundreds of thousands of millions of billions of myriads of Buddhas give to sentient beings cannot compare with those which Manjushri gives 
during a single culpa. Thereupon in the assembly, innumerable hundreds of thousands of billions of myriads of gods and nagas and yakshas and gandharavas, asuras, garudas, kinaras, mahuragas, humans and non-humans, and so forth, all said in unison, we take refuge in the youthful Bodhisattva Manjushri. We take refuge in Samanta Darshan Tathagata, the worthy one, the supremely enlightened one. After saying that, eight trillion, four hundred billion myriads of sentient beings generated the will for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Incalculable numbers of sentient beings brought their good roots to maturity and gained non-regression from the three vehicles. Okay, so that's all I'm going to read tonight. Anything pop up initially from all that? Yeah, Tony, perfect. The three vehicles, is that the... Mm. Awesome. Great question. So right at the end there, Tanya noticed it mentioned this idea of the three vehicles. So the triyana, the three yanas, the three vehicles. So I got, I have to tell you from the outset that there's a lot of mm, uh, interpretation or different, different interpretations about what the three vehicles are. Basically, if you asked me what the sutra is referring to, just uh, contextually, like just in terms of the way that it uses language, it's always referring to the shravakayana or what we call hinayana, they call it Shravakayana, the voice hearer vehicle, but it corresponds to what is also called the Hinayana. And then there's the Pratekya Buddha Yana, the vehicle or the way of the solitary Buddha, the Pratekya Buddha. And then there's the Bodhisattva vehicle, the Bodhisattva Yana. And I have to tell you that, like, as a kind of scholar historian of this stuff as well, that it's pretty clear that when you read a sutra like that, they are referring to the Shravaka, Pratekya Buddha, Bodhisattva. I talk a lot about those three vehicles and distinguish them. I have time, I'll, I'll do so in a second, but I wanna tell you that what happens is though, is that as time moves forward and these sutras become adopted as part of traditions and then traditions grow. My point is, is that in the modern world, the three vehicles are usually the Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. Those are probably the ones that most people have in mind. Hinayana, again, Shravakayana vehicle, the early monastic path, the Mahayana, what we've been talking about, and then the Vajrayana, right? The, the Vajra path, which nowadays, again, is no, mostly practiced in Tibet, Mongolia, and parts of Japan. That's sort of the main places where Vajrayana is. In my opinion, though, to speak of Vajrayana is like premature. This sutra is way before there was such a thing as Vajrayana. So I would think that it would be not appropriate for people to I guess what is called like back reading, you would back read into this that, oh, they're talking, he, he's talking secretly about the Vajrayana. Like, even though it doesn't exist yet, the Buddha knew it was going to exist. So he was talking about it. People kind of get into that stuff. And I'm like, well, but you, you remember those parts though, where they kept talking about the Shravaka, Pratekya Buddha and Bodhisattva? I think they were talking about those parts. So a quick word about those three vehicles though. In, in, you'll notice here in the end, it sort of said that the um, do, 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 incalculable, of course, incalculable numbers of sentient beings uh, brought their good roots to maturity and gained non-regression from the three vehicles. And 
I mean, the, the language of non-regression is tricky in Buddhism. I don't want to get too into it. It sort of is about, implies a kind of determined movement forward towards enlightenment in that sense versus sort of a backsliding. But what would it mean to be non-regressing towards the three vehicles? And the thing about it is, is that if you pay really close attention, these sutras don't, they don't really disparage the, hin the shravaka. I mean, they, they kind of poke, poke fun of them and they do all of that. But the point is, is that these sutras still refer to them as venerables, noble ones. Like, so they haven't lost any of their virtue or anything like that. The Mahayana just wants you to consider the Bodhisattva path as like, even better in that way, but not that there's anything wrong with that path and not that there's anything wrong with the Pratekya Buddha path. And with the time remaining, just because I am, I'm at the stopping point that I wanted to get to in the Sutra. So to talk about those three vehicles again, really quickly, the Shravaka Yana, as it's called, or the Hinayana, as it's called, as I mentioned, the reason why it's considered the small vehicle is this kind of still being focused on the self, but there's no self. And the early teaching, you know, uh, the early form of Buddhism teaches that, of course. But what they still sort of hold on to in the early path is what I call. This is just Michael language, by the way. You don't find this around, but I call, they still kind of think of a, a karmic axis, a karmic axis point at which karma is going out and karmic retribution, by which I just mean the, the results of action, come back. So the classic example is, is that when I eat, it doesn't satisfy your hunger. So there's an axis of karma here where that the karma I put out comes back to here. So even though the early tradition gets rid of the delusion of a self, they still preserve this kind of karmic axis. And that's where the focus of the practice is about one's own karma. The Pratekya Buddha, which we haven't spoken a lot lot about lately, the Pratekya Buddha is kind of like early, early Mahayana. It kind of corresponds to the Madhyamaka school, if you're familiar with Nagarjuna and the Madhyamaka. The Pratekya Buddhas are kind of associated with the Madhyamaka, or at least that kind of early Mahayana that was solely focused on emptiness dependent origination and emptiness. And from a Pratekya Buddha's point of view, there is no karmic axis. <laughs> because all is empty, I mean, you know, it gets, it's like Einsteinian physics, like where's the center? <laughs> the center is everywhere in that way. So the Pratekya Buddha is in this, they're a Buddha. I often like to remind everybody, they are given the title awakened one. They are given the title Buddha. But they're called a solitary Buddha because they don't share the teachings. They realize emptiness, independent origination. They are not, they are a Buddha. Ergo, they are in a nirvanic state. I've talked about nirvana in the past as a state of the cessation of greed, anger, and delusion. So a Pratekya Buddha is in Nirvana, they're a Buddha, they're chill, but they're kind of just in the cave in the woods, blissed out, peace. And it's, it's great for the Pratekya Buddha. <laughs> and again, there's nothing wrong with that. Like that's, that's a path, it's a yana, it's a vehicle. But again, it's not quite as immeasurable as the Bodhisattva path 
for the emphasis on sharing the teachings. The Pratekya Buddha just sits there not sharing the teachings. And in a way, the Shravaka hasn't fully realized the teachings in that way, at least from the Mahayana point of view. <laughs> All right, everybody. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas, epiphanies? Yeah, Tanya, please. I have a lot of questions today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so you were saying that the, you know, Madhyamaka school with Nagarjuna, like the early, that's like the early Mahayana and the Patekya Buddhas were kind of associated with that. Um, did the Bodhisattva stuff then come later? You know, and then just, and then just, you know, Yusha also has a, a question as well. Yep. Yeah. The chronology of all of this, meaning that those murky periods between like the real early days of Buddhism and then Mahayana, the chronology of all of that is not well documented. It's not really well understood. So we just sort of have a vague understanding of the progression of all of this. It would, just really quickly, I will tell you that the Bodhisattva path does seem to have originated with what were called the forest dwelling bodhisattvas, which do seem to basically be the Pratekya Buddhas, or at least a, a bodhisattva was a Pratekya Buddha out in the woods, trying to figure out dependent origination, get enlightened, but with no intention of necessarily coming back out of the woods. But then this bodhisattva tradition, which I introduced, I think last time as an urban form of Buddhism, that bodhisattva who's in the urban environment, that is the real beginning of Mahayana Mahayana and not protect your Buddha-ness. Yeah. You sure? Um, yeah. So um, I feel like it's so clear that uh, to me, it's very, it makes sense that bodhisattva is kind of like the only way for me to understand it ultimately, because I cannot be at peace knowing that people are doing what they're doing, you know? Like I could not just like go to the woods and do, uh, for me, that's just me. Yep. But, um, you know, and, and so I find it very beautiful, you know, profoundly beautiful and kind of a relief, you know, uh, the teachings uh, or the sutras uh, that were studying here and um and that you teach you know you all, you're just, i mean as far as i remember i mean these are generally you stick to the mahayana right yeah so um yeah <laughs> but i you know and i think i may have asked this before but um you know i'm curious about the authorship of these um you know i think they were written mainly in afghanistan right present day afghanistan uh but you know it's kind of like you know, like in um, the Christian canon, you know, like the book of Revelation and things like this, and like, uh, you know, Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus and stuff, you know, we're supposed to believe these guys, right, that they were talking to Jesus and Jesus was there and blah, blah, blah. But like, they're not, you know, um, corroborated, like in the thir first three gospels, right? So in the, the, the Buddhist tradition, it seems like, you know, somebody could have, you know, um, innovated you know which is i think perfectly fine and like you were talking about literature earlier literature to me i'm seeing the really kind of grave importance of it in uh the um on my path of wake of trying to wake up you know and so i'm just so glad that you touched on that today and mm -hmm. um could you speak about the authorship of this one for example yeah for any absolutely, of absolutely. <laughs> I'll tell you, it, it was a mystery for a, a pretty long time, like where these were coming from, all of that. And recently, actually like 21st century recently, so really only in the past 20 years, there's been a recent sort of, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, kind of branch of Buddhist scholarship where they've started discovering these interesting um, I, I guess you would call them meditation manuals. But what the meditation manuals describe 
is doing what it would be called a uh, Buddha Nishmurti, mindfulness of an image of the Buddha, uh, either a statue or a mandala, or even just mentally going through what are called the, 30, the 32 auspicious characteristics and visualizing them. And through that process, they describe the practitioner going to and receiving these auditory auditory messages from other Buddhas, receiving sutras from these Buddhas, and then bringing them back and writing them down. So they are, are painting or, or describing inspired spiritual literature and how to get in uh, access the muse, but it's a Buddhist muse. But these new documents have been fascinating for really describing in a way where a lot of these probably came from. So, awesome. And Noam, uh, a question from the center? Yeah, I think, that, do you have one too, Noam? Oh, he was just waving his hand on my behalf. Um, well, I have a comment and question. The comment is, uh, it's so interesting that when they get into, it's speaking of immeasurables, and when they get into some of the lists of, you know, thousands, billions, of hundreds of, in, in very funny order, but then at the end, they'll say myriad, <laughs> just to make sure we're not like, that we don't know what the actual number is. I think that's just it, really If awesome. I may know, yeah. it's actually that a nayuta, a myriad, Yeah. imagine a, a nayuta, a myriad being like a, a pile of a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of different ones, yeah. It's hundreds of billions of trillions of those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. We can't, oh. So we don't know how many there are all together. Well, <laughs> I see. I see what you're saying. We I mean, know how many Nayutas there are, but we don't know what's in a Nayuta. We don't know what's in a myriad. So we know it's a lot, but we don't know what the actual number is, which Speaking, I think is on purpose. This is a great segue to next week, by the way, which is about these ideas. But did, you had okay. something else? Well, yeah, at the very beginning, or not the very beginning, but at the sort of the end of the discussion of Netta or Maitri, you talked about the next Buddha would be Maitreya. And I was sort of wondering if you were going to come back to that, but you didn't. Were you going to? Was there something I, else you were going to do? I did. Did you? I, I did. I, I sort of, I, I didn't do, I didn't go back to it. I did mean to go okay. back to it. I will oh, go. Oh. No, go ahead. Oh, I, the way that I was going to go back to it, just in terms of that idea of the shift away from discipline towards the meta practice, it sort of was in my apartment complex description, where in the early version, meaning the Hinayana, the, the, uh, the historical Buddha's path, it was about discipline. And it was about like going into the apartment complex and going out and being in a disciplined way, which would look like having a shaved head and you know, all of that and begging door to door to, to your apartment complex neighbors and all of that versus the Maitreya version, which is the one I kind of described, which is where the practice is actually about being friendly and the, the realization is that those lead to the same end in that way so that that was all i suppose sorry if i got your hopes up for some grand um all right everybody that's time um so that's gonna do it for me for this evening thanks so much michael um do you do you have any announcements i do i do um so i have big announcements i finally settled on some dates and classes for everything so right away you can just go to lotusunderground.com and the home page has all of these but i have three classes coming up the one the main one that i like to tell everybody about it's my turning the dharma wheel course in buddhism it's a 10 week introduction to Buddhism, but it's my own special introduction. Uh, that's a 10 week course that's going to start October 1st, and it's going to be on Saturday mornings. You're going to get all the deeper details on the website. 
I'm also going to be starting a class on what I call the eight schools of Buddhism. And this is a survey course, basically a Buddhist history, but focused on the eight major types of Buddhism in the world. So basically breaking down the difference between Tibetan Vajrayana, Japanese Zen, the devotional Pure Land schools, the uh, Lotus Sutra school called, uh, you know, uh, the Tendai school. So all these different schools that are in the world, if you want to learn about them, sort of find out what makes each type of Buddhism different. That's my course on the eight schools. That's going to be on Tuesday mornings, 9 to 1030 a.m. starting September 20th. And then the last course I have, which most people have already signed up for who are, are, are going to take this, is a course I'm going to do on Yogacara Buddhism, otherwise known as the Mind Only School of Buddhism. And that course actually starts next week. It's a Thursday evening class, 5.30 to 7. Um, so again, you can find out tuition prices, how to register and all that on the website. So then I'll be back next Sunday.